G'day, I'm Hannah Maloney from Good Life Permaculture coming to you from Nipaluna Luchawita in Hobart, Tasmania. Today I'm going to take you for a little walk around our young food forest to show you what they are, why we do them, what's in them, all the good things and show you a couple of examples to, so you can see different plant choices. Um, let's get cracking! A food forest is a strategically chosen selection of plants with up to seven layers where they can all work harmoniously together in a compact space. However, you need to have three layers to qualify. I'm standing in the middle of a long, thin food forest planted on a steep bake at around 30 degrees angle. And we've got quite an array of different plants here, some of which we experimented with and some of which um, were very purposely chosen. It can include food crops, but also uh, pharmaceuticals, fodder crops, fibre, and so much more. I'll show you what we're doing in our garden. Um, usually in a food forest, we try to imitate a natural forest, which is all beautifully jumbled up in perfection. So you don't see neat lines of anything in a natural forest. We're doing it differently here because we're on such a steep slope of 30 degrees. Uh, uh, working in linear lines has helped to stabilise the slope more quickly and to access plants strategically from either the top or the bottom. So it's a little bit different. We've had to do a hybrid version to suit our particular context here. So at the top here, you'll see we've got some red um, bushes here, which is a Salvia gregii, which is fantastic for winter flowering and attracting all the pollinators. Directly next to it, we've got some comfrey, which is incredibly abundant in producing this leaf matter. And over summertime and autumn, I'll cut it down probably four or five times as a mulch plant, but also as a fodder plant for our goats and chickens as well. In this middle layer here, we've got a collection of uh, fruit trees. We've got nectarine, a plum, another plum, a peach, a quince at the end and an apple. And around it, we've got some of these big shrubs here, which is an ornamental wallflower, which flowers all through winter here in a really bright, sparkly way, which we love in Tassie in our cool temperate climate. So the bees go sick for it. Now, we've also got something here, which is a tagasasti plant, a tree lucin. These trees um, are, a bit, are a weed in our region, but they were already in our landscape by the hundreds. We ripped most of them out and kept half a dozen as fodder for our goats. Eventually, these will actually be cut completely out as our fruit trees on either side go up and out. So they're a short term crop for um, mostly animal fodder, but also they're fixing nitrogen into the soil as well. So they're multifunctional, as all the plants are. Two other nitrogen fixing plants we have are the native Hardenbergia and also the native uh, Indigophora australis or native indigo. And both these plants are, are stunning. Look how beautiful they are. Uh, but the fixing of nitrogen is really good for soil health. So in a food forest, we're looking at, you know, how can we feed ourselves? But maybe equally as important as how can we feed the soil for ongoing uh, and improved soil health. That's a huge thing. So while it's called a food forest or edible forest garden, it's not all about us as humans, it's about the whole ecosystem. Along the bottom row of our food forest is a long strip of globe artichokes, which again are wildly abundant in leaf matter, which our goats love. This is currently their favourite fodder that we give them every day. Um, and of course, they've got edible flower buds, which you can see over here. And so we start eating them as of now. There's so many for us and for our friends, which is beautiful. When we first did all the earthworks on the property, we had to um, stabilise the soil really quickly. So we used heat treated pellets, which you can see here, um, to uh, catch water and nutrient into the slope, and then, which then allowed us to plant directly into and accelerate the process of um, establishing the food forest, which has worked really well. And because they're heat treated, they we're totally fine for them just to break down in place over here, which is good. As well as some of those plants I've taken you through, we have quite a few other volunteer plants which have just turned up and we love that as long as they're really useful. So we've got a ricotto chili, which we actually did plant, so ignore that. But everything else like this parsley is just so abundant that we eat from all the time, every day at the moment. Nasturtiums, which are, um, you can eat the flower and the leaf and calendula as well, which you can see over here in the foreground. All these are edible um, and useful for us, but also the broader ecosystem. We love the um, nasturtium because it acts as a living mulch and it will sprawl over this slope across summer and autumn, helping to protect the soil from evaporation. Here we are in a more mature food forest, again on a steep bank, maybe even around 35 degrees um, steep for this one. 
uh, we plant all our food forests on the banks and all our terraces, or most of the terraces are for annuals and or social space. Although I have started just planting more perennials on them too, because it's so good. <laughs> but here we've got red and black currants in the front, so they're really easy to harvest. In the middle layer is a row of pajoas trees. And then under stories of creeping um, comfrey, which just sprawls all the way around. And at the top, we've got a row of mertus berries as well. So, um, so many yummy things to eat. <laughs> and here I've got a food forest, which I planted only around two months ago. So very young. Um, I've got a, a young fajoa tree in the middle, which will one day be beautifully big, surrounded by globe artichokes, which one day I'll probably uh, cut out because it'll get too crowded. But for now, I'm making use of the space where there's lots of sun and lots of room to grow. And I've got um, some marguerite daisies, which are for the pollinators and also for my eye candy. And then I've got um, some young pig face, which is a native ground cover with a beautiful fruit, which is so tasty. And then scattered throughout, I just broadcast some lupin seeds, which are a beautiful flower for the pollinators and a great uh, deep taproot to break through the heavy clay soils we, we have here. And they fix nitrogen. So many functions. They're working for the earth, for the garden, and they're working for us. If you're wondering how to actually start choosing plants, it can be quite overwhelming because there are so many plants to choose from. <laughs> a really simple guideline to keep in your brain is to think about the function of the plant. What job are they doing in your garden? Are they looking after the soil, the pollinators, you? What uh, service are they providing? And it could be in the form of food, but it could be in the form of so many other useful things. So don't get stuck on it has to be edible for you. Um, the other key thing to think about is the form, the shape and the size of the plant. So we have seven layers of the um, forest garden that we can choose from. So get familiar with different shapes and sizes of plants um, above the ground and also below ground. So the root systems aren't competing for space and for food. And so thinking about function and form of each plant that you're interested in is a really nice way of coming to uh, a concise list of plants that you can start exploring.